In 2012, so about a year after the tornado, uh, you said in an interview that the, the project you did in Joplin was, quote, the most gratifying, or one of the most gratifying reporting experiences of my life. Now, since 2012, I'm sure you've had a lot of interesting adventures, so I don't know if that would still hold, but um, what, what was it that made you say that at that time? What was it about this project in Joplin um, that you looked back on, at least, you know, from a year's perspective and said, you know, that was one of the most gratifying things I've done thus far? Sure. Um, and first, I'll say that I it, that that has not changed in the years since. And in fact, I'd say, um, you know, I, I might take the uh, the the one of the out of that phrase. I think it may have been the most gratifying kind of reporting experiences of my life, and um, or it may have been the the most um, gratifying reporting experience of my life. Um, you know, gratifying and harrowing, kind of in in, in equal measure, I guess. Sure. Um, just in terms of the stories I was hearing. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, there was there, there was something about that project that I don't know, kind of you know, grabbed me by the heart from the get go, you know, and and sort of dragged me into it, and uh, um, and it didn't let go until I was till I was finished, and it's still you know it it, it I I still um, find find myself kind of moved by what those people went through and and uh when whenever i revisit it um i feel like there's still kind of like that 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 well of whatever emotion visceral kind of emotion connection whatever that that pulled me into the story um it's still very much uh in intact yeah and you describe in this in this interview that i read that you had been in the yukon territory in far northwestern canada and then had flown into st louis and you were going to do a piece on chuck berry mm -hmm. uh, chuck berry wasn't giving as much access as you hoped you're a little frustrated the tornado had happened the day before uh in joplin right. and of course the news from joplin's all over the place and then you said i think your mom mentioned something to you that kind of got the ball rolling it, do i have that right yeah yeah, no, that's correct. I, I was originally going down um, to St. Louis to uh, to profile Chuck Berry, um, and that was a story I'd you know been been lining up for a while. Um, and uh, and I think it was the day before my flight, um, the the tornado hit, and so you know I, I was obviously aware of what had happened, and I you know you're in the airport and. CNN is, is, is nonstop coverage of mm. the, the devastation. And so I was taking it in, um, but it did seem very kind of peripheral at the moment. It was just a, a, another tragedy. Um, and, it, and it did not seem at all like anything that, that I would necessarily be writing about. I tend to write kind of long form narrative pieces um, sometimes sort of, you know, profiles of people, but other times, you know, stories about you know, events that happen um, or crimes or mysteries and things, things, things that you kind of really sort of hopefully can kind of sink your teeth into. And so um, I'd never written about, you know, a disaster or the aftermath of a disaster. And it seemed to me like that's what kind of, you know, spot news is for. That's what CNN and the networks are for you know they they provide this sort of wall to wall coverage of what's going on and sure. the relief efforts and raise attention and and all of that um, uh, and 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 it so it, the the tornado itself though obviously I was you know wrapped like everyone else was um, by kind of the the footage I was seeing um, I, it didn't it didn't strike me as something that I was going to necessarily be writing about. Um, and then I, I get to St. Louis and and I'm there for a few days, uh, kind of in orbiting around Chuck Berry, uh, trying to get more access than he was willing to give me. And um, he he was a, 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 a brilliant and, and amazing man, but he was also famously sort of cantankerous and um, uh, distrustful of, of 
the media and sort of everyone else. And so it's very hard to kind of get the type of access that that, that I wanted to ha get to um, to have um, to get that kind of access to him. Um, so I was finding myself kind of frustrated mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, feeling like the story about Chuck Berry was going to be a bust and you know not sure what to do. And uh, and then uh, I probably you know I, I was on the phone with my mom and. Uh, maybe I had like vented my frustration to her. Um, I, I don't quite remember, but what I do remember is that she said that, um, oh yeah, you're, you know, you're in St. Louis. That's not too far from, from, from Joplin. And I know you've been, you know, listening to this tour, hearing news about this tornado. I just heard something on NPR, um, an interview with uh, a, 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 a couple kids who had, survived the tornado and they had some you know taken some footage with their phone and they played some audio of this footage um and it was really it was really moving and and kind of a powerful little interview they did and the, the footage sounded kind of incredible and so you should you should look for that um just listen to it uh, she wasn't telling me to do a story about it but she said you should it was just this fascinating radio story she just heard and mm. um he recommended that I listen to it. So I did, I went online and I found the story and I listened to it um, and, and it was fascinating. And then I, I, I found the uh, YouTube page of one of the, um, uh, the, the guys who was interviewed. They had hosted the actual uh, cell phone footage, the, the, the iPhone footage right. that they had taken and that just sort of like raw and complete. And so I listened to it. Uh, or, you know, I say listen to it. It is video, but it's mostly kind of audio because the video itself is very kind of murky and dark and chaotic. Right. Um, there's some of it, but eventually it sort of just distills into pure audio. Um, and I found it to be, and what it was, uh, you know, the, the, the gist of it is uh, they started recording before they entered this sort of convenience store, um, the Fast Trip convenience store in Joplin as the tornado was bearing down on it. And then um, these three friends um, uh, <clears throat> joined a group of a couple dozen other people from all over the place in that same convenience store. Um, again, as this the tornado is approaching. Um, and they eventually, um, uh, as the tornado begins to rip this sort of gas station convenience store apart, they uh, all heard quickly into uh, this sort of walk-in beer cooler um, at the back of the store. And that's where they are when the tornado hits. was rolling the entire time right. so you get this sort of you know document of, of what happened there um and listening to it it was one of the more kind of powerful 
I think sort of documents I had ever absorbed, you know. Um, it, it was uh, both horrifying and horrible as because you you are sort of listening to people um, in what they have every right to believe are their last moments um, as they're, uh, you know, screaming, praying, you know, whispering to one another, um, all of that. And, 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 and it's just intense and terrible and, and scary. Um, but then it becomes sort of this unexpectedly moving as, you know, almost like a virus, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, repetition of I love you, I love you all sort of takes hold and they start expressing their love to one another. Um, and these are mostly strangers to one another. And they are again in, in, in what they again had every right to believe were their last moments. And they spent those moments uh, expressing their love to one another. This in, uh, I mean, that's, that's sort of, that's one of the hooks to me. The other thing was there, as it turned out, I mean, there was a whole bunch of other stuff going on and acts of heroism and uh, all sorts of things that were going on during those uh, chaotic uh, minutes and moments. Um, but that really got to me, that, that, that moved me just listening to it. And so I was left both kind of awed and moved, but also uh, very curious. I wanted to know not only who the, uh, the, the young men were who were interviewed by NPR, but who all everybody else was in, in, in the fast trip that day. Um, they, didn't, they didn't know. I mean, they were mostly strangers when they got there and they were strangers when they departed. And they, you know, it wasn't a time, uh, the aftermath, the immediate aftermath of the tornado was not a time when people were like, you know, exchanging iPhone contacts and, you know, becoming right friends. Um, they were all dispersing uh, to wherever they, they needed to go. Um, so they didn't know really uh, who, who was in there with them. The, the people who were interviewed on NPR did not know that. Um, and so I decided that if I could figure that out and get their stories, um, uh, that could be an amazing story. And so I, I called my editor and I said, look, I mean, and he, he was aware of my frustration with the Chuck Berry project. And he said, um, I, I said, you know, why don't we put Chuck Berry on hold? Uh, you know, listen to this tape, see if you agree with me that, that, that this could be a great story. And if so, how about I just go to Joplin and see what I can figure out um, uh, there. Uh, and so I did. Um, uh, oh. Yeah. Tell me the, yeah. the, the first thing you saw in Joplin, you know going in that you're going into, you know, the site of one of the most destructive tornadoes in American history. So you know that going in. What was it that you first saw um, or heard or, you know, some other information that came in that, yeah. re that really drove that point home that no, it's no longer an abstraction. This is something you know in the abstract, but actually now I'm seeing something. Do you remember that, you know, that first indication you had that, wow, this, this was just a colossal disaster that happened? Yeah, I mean, I think probably a lot of people's experiences were very similar um, in that regard, um, in terms of what, it, what that kind of first experience was. Because as, as you know, since you were there um, as well uh, in the aftermath, um, I, I mean, I remember I, I was driving in and I think it was like exactly seven days after the tornado hit. Um, I remember um, that as I was driving in, uh, President Obama was, was there mm. on the ground and he was giving a speech. And so I was listening to, to, to the speech on the radio as I was coming in um, and, uh, and, and still on the outskirts, you know, I wasn't seeing anything. You know, um, uh, but what it was remarkable um, uh, was the sort of, and and I think this is true with a lot of you know, most tornadoes is sort of the 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 binary nature of them. There's either utter destruction or nothing. You know, there is you just cross like the a, street. Yeah, exactly. So it was like it was like you're you know you you suddenly I, I think I came over a hill. Um, and everything seemed fine. And then on the other side of the hill, suddenly there was this, you know, tableau of, 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 of really, you know, what looked like 
the aftermath of say an atomic bombing in places, you know? Um, and, and this is, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've written a lot about um, atomic bombs and like missing nuclear weapons. That's a rabbit hole I've gone down in my, in my writing before. Um, and so I've sort of absorbed a lot of, uh, of the imagery from like atomic bomb tests and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and there was something, I mean, obviously it's not, the, it's not, it, 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 I probably shouldn't compare them, um, but there was something, you know, similar. No, it it really that. is. I, I think, you know, I, I kind of promised myself before I went that I would not use the cliche of it looks like a war zone. Right. But once you see it, there's really no other comparable thing, at least in my mind. And so I just, you know, I had to fall on that. I said it just looked like the place had just been carpet bombed. Um, had you seen anything in your journalistic career that was any in any way comparable to this before you saw what had happened in Joplin? Uh, not in not in person. I don't think I I don't think I have. No, I mean I've you know again, uh, video pictures things like right. that. But sure. Not in person. Um, and yeah, you... it was just the the and just driving around. Um, which I ended up doing a lot of during the, the month or so that I spent in and around Joplin. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you're just constantly struck by these almost, you, you know, surreal little, you know, visual vignettes. Like there's, a, you know, there, there, I remember a uh, um, McDonald's that had a, one of the, you know, the play palaces that they have for the kids to play in. And um, it was clear it was a McDonald's because there was like, you know, the, the M was on the ground. Um, but mm -hmm. then the only remaining the remaining thing of the store was the, uh, you know, the plastic slide <laughs> from the Clay Palace. The rest was just gone, you know. Um, Mind boggling. How many folks were there in the cooler of the fast trip? Yeah, the, I mean, I don't have the precise number, but I, about a couple dozen. What appealed to me about the Joplin story was in many ways how kind of self-contained it was, how it was yeah. not, it, it wasn't something where I was trying to tackle the whole story of the tornado. It was something where I was trying to look at the tornado through this very sort of with blinders on basically through this limited lens of these people. And yeah. that was something that I felt capable of doing. Um, yeah. Uh, you, you uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, you mentioned, um, you know, the process of, of gaining trust. Mm -hmm. um, I guess this is pitched more, just more broadly in your, to you as a writer, you want to get access to folks and to get them to talk to you. Um, and some folks are very open to that, others are gonna be less so. What was your strategy or what was your style in Joplin when, you know, you had folks who were reluctant to talk. How did you, how did you go about gaining trust? Yeah, uh, I mean, in some cases, uh, it was just a matter of, and this often happens on stories, uh, you know, I would be talking, I'd get some people who were, were willing to talk to me. Um, and then, uh, once they did that, and once they spoke to me kind of at length and sort of saw where I was coming from, um, and basically I think saw that I wasn't looking to do kind of a sort of sensationalistic quick hit piece on right. what they had done or gone through and, and sort of just, you know, drag them through the, the worst day of their lives, yeah. just for some kind of cheap thrill, you know? Right. Um, I think that they, once they got a sense that 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 wasn't where I was coming from, that I was looking to do something sort of complete and respectful. Um, uh, they, they, would, they, would, they would talk to me and, 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 or they would feel comfortable talking to me and opening up further to me. Um, and then they, in turn, the people who were more reticent about speaking to me, they might speak to them and say, you know, he, this guy actually doesn't seem all that bad, you know, Mm. Let's maybe maybe give them a chance and and, sure. and, and go from there. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean that that was was part of it. Um, and and there were only a few cases where people, you know, at first didn't want to talk to me and and then ultimately did. Um, much more challenging was actually just finding the people. That was that was 
the real challenge. Yeah, I guess. So how did you how did you do that? That was, you know, I, I, I started with the three friends, um, you know, who you know, from from the NPR story. So those were kind of already in the bag, in, in a sense, because I knew their names, they, they'd already been reported on and all of that. Um, and then I, uh, um, I just started, uh, let's see, um, I, I, I remember, you know, I asked them, do they remember the names of anybody else in there? Um, and, uh, and, or for, and for descriptions of everybody that was in there. Um, they remembered that the convenience store clerk, um, that his first name was Ruben. Um, uh, and I think that I then got to Ruben through Fast Trip, maybe, you know, I, I think maybe I, I, I got his full name from Fast Trip and then connected to him through Facebook or something. Um, uh, a lot of what, a, a lot of finding, you know, who, who all was in there ended up being kind of the result of sort of <laughs> almost like a forensic digging around the ruins of the Fast Trip itself. And so we, we're right in here. That right there is where we climbed out. All right, so here the inside we made kind of like a beer wall to climb up right back here a week after the event minimal cleanup had been done mm -hmm. so all of the uh you know the cars that had been trashed there were still there some of them wrapped around trees and telephone poles and whatnot um and so the fast trip uh was still just utter ruins surrounded by wrecked cars um so i went you know climbing through cars looking for paperwork um, and found names that way, found like insurance documents. And, and I was like, well, this might, this car was here. So maybe this person was here. And then I called and, you know, well, that's actually, you know, that's actually my wife's, my wife was there that, you know, you found my, you know, my paperwork, but my wife was there and I'll put you through to her and da, da, da. And so that's, um, that, that's kind of how, how it went. Um, wow. I remember also like at one point, um, you know, pe people were making, uh, pilgrimages black to the spots where either they or their friends had gone through things. So at one point when I was just hanging around the fast trip, like looking at, you know, trying to get a sense of where the cooler was and all that, there, I noticed that there were a couple other people that were just looking at it and talking to one another. And I approached them and asked if they'd, they'd been there and they said, no, but we know, you know, our friends were there and, and they put me in, you know, gave me the names of some friends. So a lot of it was, was, was that sort of, that sort of work. Um, oh, and once I had the names, just reaching out to them often through Facebook. I mean, Facebook is a great tool for that sort of thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, that sounds, that sounds like a, like a fascinating um, process. You, you were in Joplin for about a month. Where did you stay? Yeah. So I say in and around Joplin for about a month. So I stayed for the first, I don't know, two or three nights that I was there. Um, I stayed in uh, maybe, yeah maybe three or four, I don't know. Um, I stayed in the basement of a church um, that was set up as a, as a shelter. Um, and for, for, for both people from Joplin and for uh, people who were doing, you know, cleanup and recovery work. Um, and so I stayed there and I, I, I didn't actually have all that much reporting to do at first because I would go to the fast trip, I would do some of that work, yeah. but there wasn't anything to occupy my days. Um, so those first, like, I don't know, three or four days, I spent most of my days just like working with a cleanup crew, like just going around in the trucks and doing the kind of work that I imagine that you were doing as well. Just um, moving debris and things like that. Yeah, just moving debris and, and, and all of that stuff. Um, uh, so did that and then um, uh, 
eventually it, it was clear I wasn't going to be able to do both the reporting and continue with the, the cleanup work. And, and so I ended up getting a hotel in Springfield um, where I stay, stayed for, you know, the rest of the three weeks or whatever. Wow. Um, yeah. I would really love to hear about your time in the, uh, at the church, mm -hmm. because as I've been talking to folks, Again, it's one, you know, you have this experience where you know something, but it becomes concrete as you actually see things, talk to people. And really a story that's emerged in my discussions is how really immediately um, locals began to mobilize, particularly churches began to mobilize and responded to this thing in a, in a way that from the accounts I've heard, you know, when FEMA got there, FEMA was really impressed with what had already been done by the churches. Can you share your memories about this church that apparently opened its doors uh, for folks to stay in? What what sort of work was that church doing? What what was going on? Just what are your memories about that time there? Yeah, I mean, they were doing, they were acting as a sort of a, a shelter and a hub, mostly for people who were doing kind of recovery work. Um, they had a in, in sort of one of the main areas, they had kind of a food dispensary set up, food and water. Um, I think they were also doing, you know, a, a lot of the sort of the, 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 the recovery work was, was both the cleanup, but also like dispersing, you know, food and water to folks who, who may have ne needed it. Um, uh, and I'm, I, I'm not really clear on, whether on how much of the sort of the, the the cleanup and recovery work that was taking place sort of through the church was actually being organized by the church um, mm -hmm. or how much they had sort of opened their doors to other you know agencies or groups that needed a place to use as their hub um, but one way or another they they clearly were being very um very helpful and um and yeah. generous with their, their 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 space sure in this yeah. in this time you're there you're very focused on your project but did you did you witness what you know folks who who live in Joplin what they refer to and that is just sort of this um tsunami of people who converge on Joplin church groups not just church groups but a lot of church groups Habitat for Humanity comes in Samaritan's Purse did you witness that sort of thing of just these waves of people coming in? Certainly there was a diverse and growing group of people um, descending on Joplin while I was there. Um, you know, everything from people, again, who, as you mentioned, who just, you know, heard about it, wanted to contribute in some way and just sort of showed up um, to people who were almost like, you know, professional disaster responders, you know, or, or, or it, even if some of them weren't so professional, sort of habitual disaster responders is people who just go, kind of go wherever the trouble is and hope they can do something. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, certainly uh, Joplin clearly kind of touched the, the, the nation and, and, and drew people from all over the nation um, to help one way or another. Yeah. You mentioned um, that in this, you know, your your focus is, uh, you know, what happens in the fast trip in this uh, pretty short period during the during the tornado. And so your, I mean, really terrific piece in Esquire just, you know, um, revolves around that. As you're talking to folks, as you're there on the scene, I've even seen video where you have them, the, the fast trip is no longer there, but you, uh, but you have them sort of crouch where they think they were and you try to reenact that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very impressive what you describe. Um, doing what under normal circumstances would not be cool, rifling through people's cars to find documents. But, yeah, no, but you know, in, in, yeah, in this case, um, it makes perfect sense and it, and it works out. Um, I did worry that because obviously, you know, there was a lot of talk about uh, looting and people, you know, warding off loot looting by any means necessary. Um, so I did worry a little bit when I was you know, rifling through wrecked cars. Somebody might mistake me for a looter. Well, 
Yeah, I hear that. But, um, you know, listening to you describe that, you know, I really appreciate and, and admire that sort of that, um, that devotion to tracking these folks down to get their story. As you're talking to them, as you're doing all of this, I, you know, as you're living with this story for uh, this month or so in Joplin, and then the whole writing and re revising process, and I gather from what you say in the interview from 2012, I mean, the article underwent some significant revision as you're thinking things through, you're living with this story for a long time. Are there particular moments um, that are especially poignant in your mind or particular things, something someone said that really stands out in your mind as you look back on, I guess, on, on the whole process of, you know, the beginning from your mom tells you about the video to the article has now been published? Or is there something that particularly stands out in your mind as you think about it? Well, um, so you mentioned that you saw a video online of uh, me kind of getting getting the group together and 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 trying to organize them the way they had been in the uh, in the cooler. Well, y'all, what I want to do first, basically, because uh, Matt's gonna Matt's gonna do some group shots and he'll probably have you in sort of various configurations. First thing I wanted to actually first thing I wanted to do is just thank you again for coming out because this I, I like honestly this has been a, an amazing experience the whole you know few weeks I've spent here in Joplin and you are an incredible group of people and uh, I mean I just appreciate you telling me your stories and and I hope I can I can do your stories justice because because uh, again it's been it's been an, a moving and amazing experience for me uh, getting to, to work with you guys a little bit and uh, and get to know you all a little bit. Second thing is one of the things that I've been asking you all about when I meet you is sort of how exactly you were when you were in the cooler. And so what I'd like to do now, since you're all here, is if we can try to figure out, sort of arrange yourselves more or less, obviously we don't even know exactly where the cooler was, but if you all could sort of arrange yourselves more or less where you were when the tornado hit, if that makes sense, like um, inside the cooler. Um, the order you yeah, exactly. Sort of the order you were in. So, you know, talk to the people around you, try to figure that out. And <laughs> so that video was taken on a day that um was uh near the very end of the reporting process mm -hmm. um it was after i had basically found them all and and it was after i had spoke sat down with each of them and, and gotten their individual stories uh, which is what i did basically once i found them all i would just sit down and, and just get everybody's story and then all i all i had to do really was splice them all together um but uh then I, I, I decided uh, on one of my last days in Joplin that now that I had met them all sort of individually, it would be great to get them together collectively. Mm -hmm. um, and so I arranged for basically like a little barbecue um, and, and got them, got them together. Um, first we met in like, I don't, it was like a conference room at a hotel um, is where we had the actual barbecue. Um, right. and then we all kind of caravaned out to the side of the fast trip and um, uh, so that they could kind of, you know, in many cases, it was the first time they'd returned there since, since the day, um, which had been by that point a little more than a month before. Um, um, but I also just did want them, you know, it was going to help me to see them kind of walk through um, physically sort of the, the, the locations they had been that day. Um, uh, and I remember that uh, at one point, one of the, the, the mother, a mother who had not been there, um, but who's, uh, uh, one of whose children had been in the cooler, um, came up to me and said that, you know, um, that, it was so great that that her daughter was able to connect with all these people um, because otherwise, uh, you know, had had I not kind of found them all, she might never have seen them um, again. And it had been a very sort of 
tearful, emotional day as they got back together. And she said, you know, this, this day is, 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 you know, worth more than, you know, a lot of therapy. Um, I know that this is going to be something that lasts. And, and, um, and so that was extreme, you know, as a, as a journalist, I, I find that I'm often, it's often like a, a, a one way street, like I'm just taking, you know, I'm taking people's stories. Um, and I'm not giving them much in return, you know, I, I hopefully I, I can do their stories justice, you know what I mean. Um, but I did feel like in this case, I was able to give a very small gift of just reconnecting these people uh, to one another. And, yeah. and, and again, they, they began that the day of the tornado as strangers, but ultimately they connected in, 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 in a profound way. Um, and so, so it, was, it, it was extremely gratifying for me to be able to help reconnect them after that day. Wow, wow, that's, that's yeah, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful thing. I imagine each story you write, you know, you're learning something new about human nature, about people, about the world. Um, so I guess my, my very, very broad question is, what did this whole experience in Joplin, writing about Joplin, meeting these folks, experiencing sort of that, you know, the, the world of Joplin in the aftermath of that storm, writing this story, interacting with these folks, what did that teach you or what idea did that strengthen in your mind or maybe another way of thinking about it you know how did how did this event impact you you just told us you know how you you were able to have an impact on them and they and this woman expresses that to you how did this event impact you um so uh, one of the sort of revisions that the story went through um or changes that the story went through in revisions um, was the 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 title. Um, I very rarely get <laughs> get any sort of say in in the titles of my stories, um, and I didn't this time. But the title that I wanted um, was uh, uh, was I was I was a quote from from that that you know the footage um, was I love all of you. Right. And I wanted that in quotations and I wanted that to be the title. Right. Mm -hmm. And that to me had a double meaning. A, it was it was this pivotal moment in the story that I was telling. Um, but it was also, you know, after having spent so much time with these people um, and in Joplin, it was sort of I felt like I felt that way towards these people. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think what. And, and, and more broadly, I felt like what the story, if the story with what they went through has sort of a lesson to give, it's kind of how, um, it, it's how that kind of love for other people, even strangers, um, does appear to reside somewhere within us um, uh, at all times, possibly, um, latent, you know, often buried under all sorts of garbage um but that it is there and that it can come out um even in the worst moments or maybe mostly in the worst moments um and 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 so that to me that that's that's kind of what moves me about the story and what continues to move me about the story um and i i don't think that's something it's not something that we have access to all the time but i do think that possibly it's there and that 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 that, that, that you know the joplin what they went through is sort of in part evidence of that. I mean, I, I think, you know, you often hear of um, the, and, and I'm going to butcher the like <laughs> French pronunciation, but the esprit de corps, you know, the, 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 um, the sort of the, the, the spirit that we feel in the, in, in the people feel in the military towards their, mm -hmm. their, um, you know, their fellow soldiers and that, you know, people who are in, you know, foxholes together are, are always willing to die for one another. And, and become selfless and 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 you often hear that that's something that is you know it's drilled into you through basic training and all this stuff that you learn to view your co-combatant as your brother and da 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 i mean what and and that may very well be true i don't know um but what joplin seemed to show is that you know you don't need to be in the military you don't need to be a soldier you don't need to be any of that to have that degree of selflessness inside you these people seem to have that at you know, at ready, deep inside them already, 
You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that maybe we all do somehow.